um, I will. Oh, the lady's just told us. Hello, lady. I think we all need to consent to the recording now as well. That's the latest Zoom update, which is a good thing. Um, at certain points, I will ask you to use the chat box and things. And, and Tom said he will circulate the chat afterwards. You can't save the chat automatically, but he will circulate the chat. So if you did want to share contact details, and things like that, please do, because we've got quite a swift session. We've got a lot to pack into our two hours today. So there won't be that much opportunity for networking. And I know that's that's a real, you know, when we're face face to face and we're eating a nice lunch together or something, that's there's a real good opportunity to just chat and say hello to folk. So if you did want to put, you know, your LinkedIn or your Instagram or, or whatever in, in the chat box, then that would be shared around. Right. So, oh, yes. And also you can send a private message to me if you have any particular access needs that you just want me to know about uh, and for me to take into consideration through the day. You Please pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to make sure that we cater for you. Um, because there's a few of us, we might not get the opportunity like in every section for everybody's voice to be heard. Um, but again, I would say if, if you're you're waiting to ask a question or something, do put it in the chat and I'll do my best to get round to everybody. Um, but please be assured that your voice is very valued, valued today and it's really important that um, I'll try and get round to everybody. For those of you who have got your cameras on just now, I'd just like to know where you're at in terms of your energy today. I know we're, we're, we're Thursday, we're nearly at the end of the week. So if this is your scale here, whoop, whoop, at the side of your screen, where would you put yourself in terms of energy right now? So this is like, I'm so hyper, I could scream. And, and this would be like, I, I, I'm, I'm this close to sleeping. Where would everyone put themselves? Okay, let's have a look. If you're lurking, pop your camera on, show me. Okay, we've got a lot of people in the middle ground. This is good, this is good, okay. If, if we have time at the end, we won't have time at the end. I'll run out of time for sure, but if we have time at the end, I'll see where everybody is. Oh, thanks, Rona, where's your hand, Rona? I just missed your hand. There it is, oh, it's higher, that's good. All right, thank you. If you are about, I, I appreciate in webinars and things, you, it is very easy to also kind of do a bit of work and squeeze a bit of extra stuff in. But I give you permission today that you can just spend the time, if you can, just being with us. Um, have your camera on if you are just focusing on the screen, because it is so nice to see your faces. There is something a little bit inhuman sometimes, isn't there, about these rectangles. We all look like Muppets. But there are ways and means that we can connect. I don't always say to use the reactions buttons because I, I find them a bit weirdly inhuman, but because there's quite a few of us and we're going over two pages, if you do want to ask a question or get my attention, putting the hand up really works because then everybody shifts around and it puts you right next to me on the screen. So if you want to catch my attention, use that reaction button at the bottom that says raise hand. And just remember, you do need to put your hand back down again. Um, otherwise you'll just <laughs> stay there with your hand up. Okay, that's a bit about how we're approaching this today. So, um, okay, definitions. Co-production is one of those tricky ones. It, it takes me back to when I was doing my master's in sort of 99, 2000 and, and that there was all these tricky things around community art, mm, tricky words. Um, so co-production is a tricky one. So I've come up with a definition for today. I'm gonna bring up a slide in a minute and I'll ask you to just kind of go with me on that. It might differ a little bit from your, your definition, but this is just what we're basing it on for today. So let's just bring up the slide. Here we are, and I'm going to commit the, the biggest faux pas there is of, of facilitation. I'm gonna read out what it says on the slide, but this bit's important. It's the only slide I'm going to read out. So co-production. For today, we are saying it is a way of creating arts experiences, working alongside some of the intended audience, shifting the community from just receptor to creator. It's a meaningful reciprocal relationship where all people benefit. That's it for today. Okay. And that's, that's I've got one more slide that and that'll be my PowerPoint over for the whole thing. Um, 
I could see from the uh, questionnaire you filled in when you were booking that we've got a real range of experience in the room today. Some of you are really experienced in co-production. Some of you haven't really delved into it at all. But I would say that what we're going to look at today, there'll be something in it for everyone. If you are more experienced, you can just spend this time to focus on pushing your practice a bit further. And if, if you're new to it, hopefully we'll arm you with lots of new ideas and different approaches to how you in your setting can engage with people, just engage with humans in a way that is meaningful and impactful and creative. I mentioned the word community there as well in that definition and and again that can that can mean lots of different things but for the purposes of today community um, means one of two things it's either people living in a specific geographical area or a specific group of people who might gather together because of a particular interest or need. Now there's an irony here a paradox perhaps that we're doing a webinar on co-production and I purposefully haven't invited anyone who's been involved in a co-production process as a, as a community member, as it were, along today. And there's a reason for that. It was an intentional reason. And, and it goes back to that idea of it being reciprocal, because I didn't know what they'd get out of it. Because this is a, a coming together of um, museum and, and gallery um, staff, professionals. Um, and I, I wasn't sure they would be giving us something, but I'm not sure we'd be giving much back. So I purposely did, left that voice out of this conversation. But of course, what we're going to explore through our case studies, and we've got some fabulous case studies coming up, we can hear about how those voices have been heard and used in, in the creation of creative processes. Okay. So we're doing good here. Right, what's the point? That's my next item on the agenda. What's the point? What's the point of doing it? Can you pop into the chat reasons that you would do, you would do co-production? What have, if for those of you who have, um, do have a creative production practice, why do you do it? What's the point? Why bother? It's more work than it. It could be if you just did things on your own, surely. Let me know. To get different perspectives. Yes, Helen. Making exhibitions displays more relevant. That's lovely, Jill. To create more meaningful exhibitions, connecting with audiences, communities. To get better engagement and richer ideas, to build new audiences. Because we're missing something without them involved add more voices to give the community a voice. A point, port, importance of lived experience when telling stories, yes. To bring artist and audience closer, to learn from others, challenging traditional hierarchies and to challenge ourselves. Oh yes, challenge, love it. To make the narrative more reflective, I know I'm missing some here, but you can see them too. These are fabulous. And that's the thing, Tracy, isn't it? If the project, the thing that you're trying to do isn't relevant to the people you're trying to reach, there really is no point, is there? Um, and we've got to a place, a really hugely exciting place, I think. There's, there seems to be a tipping point, a turning point in, um, I'm seeing it through arts funding, certainly in Scotland, the, the culture collective which is a new initiative that's been happening as part of the covid recovery response from creative scotland is really focusing on how to work um, with communities and, and give communities ownership over a creative process things are shifting and these reasons i think are, are what's shifting it before we delve into the case studies um we're also looking at the key ingredients uh, and I said I had one more slide. I've got, I was kind of trying to boil down what I, I believe are the key ingredients of a good co-production process in any setting. I'll bring it up just now, but please put in the chat any, anything I'm missing, because I'm certainly missing something. Right, let's just share that. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so the, the key ingredients that I put down here are time, generosity in the broadest sense, so a generosity of ideas, generosity of stuff and resources, a generosity of your time and people's time, a willingness to be uncomfortable, that, that challenge that was coming through there in, in the chat, optimism, inspiration, trust, and this one I can boil down to, to one or a, a small amount of words, a willingness to sit down and have a cuppa when things are getting tricky. Okay, now I realize I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna come back out of that so I can see the chat. A sense of ownership, no, that was before. So is there anything missing from that list of key ingredients that you would like to see on there? Maybe I've nailed it. Pathways. Deanna, could you unmute and explain what you mean by pathways? Um, as someone who's practiced um, co-creation for quite some time now, um, I try to find ways of creating pathways where they can be employed or um, maybe be a part of a steering group or even grow confidence in being a part of a trustee board. And so where I, I think about the long term of what a co-productive process can look like for them. And so I think about long term impact and what that can look like for them. So I think about I think about pathways a lot for them as well. And how, even though I may be working with a group of people and together they're, they're, they're amazing, I also think about the individual as well, what their gifts and their talents are and how I can link them maybe to different forums or to different people within the, art sec within the arts and heritage sector they can connect to if they, choose, if they choose to do so or how they can transfer skills that they've improved or amassed during the process into other sectors. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, that, that those pathways and opportunities for progression, something that um, um, I was discussing with, with Sarah, um, Sarah Martin, your, your S Martin there, but we were discussing that, weren't we, as, as what happens, what's the progression beyond a project? If you, you whip a group of people up into an enthusiastic Ferrari and then the project ends, what what are you, what's that doing to your relationship with the community? Yes, absolutely. So managing those expectations. Laura, you've, you've come up with three there. Do you want to say something there? Hi. Um, yeah, just the importance of, of good partnerships and ones that are based on um, shared values, ones that are established um, from the beginning and that good dialogue is is maintained and established from the beginning and I'm, and when I say partnership I mean all stakeholders so that's the partners with the community groups as well as any other partners who might need to be involved or who are connected to those community groups as well as a, a organization or institution that you might be working from um, managing expectations hugely important um, being really I think that's about being really clear right from the beginning about what your purpose is and why you're doing it and why they want to do it um, and that leads a little bit into the pathways as well which I do I agree are really important and that's uh, for me that's really thinking about legacy so trying to move away from projectism um, and actually make it something that is um, that is meaningful for all parties involved. Projectism I've never heard that before but I quite like that projectism yes not thinking just within the confines the bubble of the project is that what that sort of means yeah absolutely but I think longer it's, what's about the challenges I mean that's about challenges of funding as well that you lot yes. of work do your um sh they're short term time limited um you know again that's the thing with pathways so why are you doing it is it just to do this a nice project or is it actually to have a longer lasting impact Absolutely. And that's that's a really a perfect segue actually into um, I'm about to introduce the case studies, but there is there's so many barriers that 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 exist in, in our way of working and how we get things funded, especially if you're a smaller organization that has to sort of survive on, on a kind of cocktail of, of funding. Um, but there are ways through it, aren't there, with determination and optimism and 
and and an eye to that what other pathways what's the progression what's the legacy of this project you can find ways of doing it okay so we have three fabulous uh, presentations coming up for you now um, that um, hopefully give you a real variety of different approaches with co-production um, so i won't i'm not going to introduce each one because i think these these fabulous people are very good at introducing themselves um, but yes uh, if you do have questions that come up feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat whilst that's going on because there will be a panel conversation afterwards after the three presentations. Okay, and the first up is Emma from First Sight. Over to you, Emma. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen, get my presentation on there. Um, okay. Okay, um, can you all hear me properly? I've realised that my office is it's got there's quite a lot of fans in here because it's really warm, as I as you might know. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Emma. I'm the program manager for communities at First Sight, and here's a picture of First Sight. We're in Colchester. Um, I've been working for First Sight since um, June 2019. Um, First Sight well, it has been designed by the architect um, Raphael Vignoli, uh, opened in 2011. Um, it was conceived as a regeneration project um, for East Anglia. Um, we're part of the Plus Tape Network and we're an Arts Council MPO. Um, so it didn't really all go to plan at the beginning, like when First Sight was being built, um, it was really late and it was really over budget as well. And actually um, feeling in the local community um, was quite bad towards first sight for a very long time. Um, when our current director, Sally, arrived here in 2016, we were kind of on the brink of bankruptcy and we were in a special like Arts Council special measures. Um, we, had, we had actually been removed from the national portfolio um, at that point. Um, and basically the way that it's all turned around for us is completely because of community engagement. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that now. So, um, Sally says that we're trying to be three things basically, and that's um, fun, free, it's four things, fun, free, fantastic, and for everyone. Um, she says fun, it might sound flippant, but actually it's really, really important and quite difficult to do. Um, free, you know, we don't charge an entry, but actually that's not the, that's not all of it because um, people still have to get here and um, whether that means bus fare or whether that means, you know, another like babysitting or I don't know, whatever, whatever that means, free never really means free. So that's something that we're working on is kind of bringing those barriers down. Um, fantastic is challenging ourselves. So we might be in a little old Colchester in Essex, but actually we're trying to take on the world. <laughs> um, and if the idea is that if we can do all of those things, um, then we can work towards being for everyone. So we're working towards our visitors and our workforce uh, representing the kind of national um, statistics. So for example, you know, in Colchester, um, the populace is, kind of overwhelmingly white but actually we're working towards a more national statistic on that because we realise that we don't just represent people in Colchester we are trying to um, work with people wider as well. Um, we do three things so local um, artists and culture from the region so this is Sally our director of Grace and Perry who is an Essex artist. Um, we also have a really, in, uh, Colchester has a really rich history of um, kind of cultural icons. So we've got um, John Ball, who was the leader of the Peasants' Revolt in the medieval period. So we do quite a lot um, around around him. Um, we've also got Jane Taylor, who was the person that wrote Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, um, and William Gilbert, who discovered static electricity. So those are some very early ones, but there's plenty of newer ones as well. Um, 
national. So this is um, a statue of uh, Millicent Fawcett, the campaigner for women's suffrage. Um, this statue was commissioned jointly by First Sight and the Mayor of London from the artist Gillian Waring and international, sort of unintentionally. Um, during the, the COVID-19 lockdowns, we started making activity packs. Um, we contacted all the artists we'd ever worked with um, and we kind of put together these really fantastic activity packs. So we made three all together. Um, on the first one, we had over 40,000 downloads just from the first one. And those are from all over the world. Um, so we um, also uh, made physical copies of them and distributed them for free locally with um, food parcels for people that were shielding. Um, so that's just a little bit of, I guess, like history and context. Um, so moving towards more towards the present, um, this is uh, uh, the Labena Himage show that we had in, I believe it's 2017. Um, this was kind of the start of where our, the way that we work now came from, because as part of this show, from which um, Labena went on to win the Turner Prize, um, we had built in some funding to work with um, ethnic minority groups in our community. Um, and that's where, that's where this kind of all started. And we found that it's a, this new way of working has inverted the whole organisation. And it's been really key to our recovery from that situation we were in, but also even prior to COVID, it was really key to our recovery. And one of the first um, conversations that Sally had after we got this funding was she spoke to this lady uh, whose name is Rachel Walton, and she runs a local organisation called African Families in the UK. Um, and she had a conversation with Sally and she said, you know, the problem is here that there's other things that people are worried about. One of those things is holiday hunger, which I don't think um, Sally realised was such a big issue for people in Colchester. 25% of children in Colchester live in poverty, and that's actually enough to fill the whole of Colchester Stadium. Um, <laughs> and the other issue is, you know, Rachel was saying that your issue is you're running an, you're, you're running an art gallery. Like, not everybody recognises what you're putting in here as culture. Um, for uh, the families that Rachel was working with, culture is something that you eat, wear and share. So it's about thinking about culture in a, in a different way and actually challenging ourselves. Um, so we reacted to what Rachel had said um, in several ways. Um, firstly, we started running a programme called Holiday Fun, um, which had been running for several years now. It's a programme that runs during all of the school holidays um, every single day. Um, we have free uh, food, art and sport activities. It's for all families, but it's free to those who qualify for free school meals. Um, although we don't, we don't actually check that they do because we realise that there's some other families who are in need and might not qualify for that. Um, for example, um, refugee families who have no recourse to public funds. Um, this is also where the ideas for our um, Arts Council collection bid came from. So we applied to be an Arts Council collection partner around this time as well. And we, we were successful in our, in our application um, for the period between 2019 to 2022. So we're in that right now. Um, and what we kind of said that we were going to do was um, really try and get closer to other people's understanding of culture, get as many people involved in our programme, in our exhibitions as possible, and working towards true co-production through um, sharing of culture. So I'm just going to share um, one of the exhibitions that we've made as part of this um, programme. So we're on our third, fourth one now. Um, so this um, exhibition was called um, My Name Is Not Refugee and we worked with um, Refugee Action Colchester who already used the building, um, already used the building very regularly to um, have their meetups. So they have a big monthly meetup with kind of about, about 150 people um, and then smaller events as well. So we already had a really good relationship with them um, because we kind of do for, 
so when Sally started, she she had the idea of um, the rooms in our building, community groups can book those for free. So it kind of meant that we had all these people in the building, but we didn't really see them reflected in the exhibitions and they didn't really see the exhibitions as being a space that they would want to go necessarily. Um, so we just wanted to try and um, rectify that, I suppose. Um, so I start, we started this project by contacting the directors of Refugee Action Colchester and asking them to help us identify people who they thought might benefit from being involved. Um, so we got through, the, through them, we got together a small group of um, refugees and asylum seekers and we just started with a conversation. So we talked about questions that they might want to ask to the wider group of um, the wider group of um, kind of clients of Refugee Action Colchester. And the questions they came up with were, what is the main purpose of humanity? Um, do you live your life by force or by choice? And how do you know what is right and what is wrong? Very big. <laughs> so we um, translated those questions into the main languages of um, Refugee Action Colchester clients. And we spent several months um, talking, going to, the, I went down to the monthly meetings and I chatted to people. We got as many responses as we, as we could. I think we got about 45 in the end. Um, and this is a word cloud of kind of the, I guess like the, the most common words that came out. Um, so we kind of used this to pull out themes that we could then base an exhibition around. So at this point, we didn't even introduce any artwork or anything um, because I didn't want to lead the discussion and also didn't want to frighten people because most of um, the people that were involved had no experience of art whatsoever. And there's nothing more frightening than looking at the Arts Council Collections website if you don't, you know, if you don't um, have that confidence. Um, so the themes, the common themes that came out of those answers were belief, communication, environment, impermanence and journey. Um, so at this point, we started introducing the collection um, and initially um, we kind of worked with the Arts Council curators because it's quite difficult to search thematically on the website um, and their suggestions at this point were um, very boats and suitcases, you know. Uh, so um, what we ended up doing is we took the, the steering group um, for the exhibition down to London and actually met with the Arts Council curators over a coffee and just chatted through the nuances of experience and kind of talked about the themes in more depth. Um, and after that happened, um, we got a new list of suggested works from the Arts Council and it was much, it was much kind of... I guess, what's the word? I want to say rounder, but it felt more like it really covered all of the things that they were trying to say. Um, and this whole process between starting the conversations and opening the show was a year and a half. Um, so we had plenty of time to talk through the works that make the decisions and hone the presentation of the show. So everything about the show was chosen by this group or was from a conversation with the wider group down to the color um, the choice of languages, the choice of works, um, how we chose to interpret things as well. Um, we've also got the, the texts in multiple languages on the wall um, as well. So um, we really carefully chose the works in the show. Um, for example, the, the beautiful painting of the vase of roses over here um, came from a conversation with one of the ladies about what is the smell of home um, and actually for her she said the smell of home is roses and we talked about um, you know Damascene roses Damascus and Syria um, so to take that a little bit further we had the idea of actually putting rose petals and other smells into the show this was a little bit thwarted by Covid because obviously people couldn't really smell them because they had their masks on <laughs> and it opened around that time um, but we did get the beautiful visual was still there and it was just really nice to see these little kind of, um, I guess, interventions into the space. Um, right. um, obviously, within the refugee experience, there is an incredible amount of trauma and some a decision that we made together quite early on was um, to reference that 
but not to make it the main point of the show because actually we wanted to make a space which was comfortable for um, refugees and asylum seekers to be in. So I think the worst thing would be to go in there and then be re-traumatized. <laughs> so <laughs> we kind of, um, so we used pieces like this instead. So this is, this blanket is a piece by Christine Borland and it's a blanket which was used on a firing range and then the bullet holes have been really carefully mended. So it's kind of referencing that healing that happens after, but I didn't, we didn't have anything which said, this is why this is in the show. It was kind of people to realize for themselves. It doesn't, it doesn't hit you in the face, so to speak. And um, well, we definitely had many conversations about what was appropriate and what wasn't. And it was quite, you know, obviously extremely emotional at times. Um, environment was a massively important thing um, to the group. Um, we talked about things like a lot of refugee families feel more comfortable being outdoors because the indoors is a space which is very, uh, a Western home is a space which is very unfamiliar and quite uncomfortable. And you don't know the rules of the home, like the unspoken rules of the home. So we definitely um, talked most of the time about food and nature. So there's a couple of pieces here which kind of cover, we had this lovely David Rebilliard, um, cultural differences melt when you start slurping. <laughs> um, and then there's also a film here of a project that the group um, did over lockdown with a local um, community garden. It's called um, Together We Grow at Home. And um, these, so they went up to this beautiful garden and learned how to grow their own vegetables, it, either there or also at home in the very limited space that they might have and how they could get around having limited space. Um, and something which we did alongside the show was put some raised beds outside on the cafe balcony at first sight and we had a group of um, clients actually come and install that. So you can see some volunteers from Refugee Action here around one of the clients just putting in those and we're planning, we're building those into our ongoing program, so they won't just be taken away again, you know. Um, so we're going to grow things which we can use in the cafe and also that we can use in the learning program. So it ties quite nicely to holiday fun as well. Um, Emma, Emma, two minutes left. Okay, I'm nearly there, I promise. I can go faster. <laughs> um, this wall here was talking about how did you see England before you arrived? Um, it's talking about kind of the idealized view. Um, but in the bottom left, you can see a lovely little box which was given by one of the group for the exhibition. And it includes um, linden leaves, which are the most popular tree in Turkey where she comes from, so the lime tree. Um, and I've just got, uh, so the same person uh, with the, the box also talked about her experience. And I've just got a really short film to show. Uh, it's about 40 seconds of her talking about it. Um, so I'll just show that to you now, see if I can get it up. Oh my gosh, it always disappears, doesn't it, when you need it? Whew. I just realised that I just need to check if, could you hear that? Wait a minute. Oh, it's yeah, we can. Apart now, isn't it? You can hear it. Great. Yeah, you can, okay. hear, can hear it. Describe as a period I personally experienced. What I experienced as written on the wall, it is unbelievable, but it is believable. <laughs> so this is the this is a gift. No another word to explain it. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I just have one more slide basically and then that's the end. So this is a piece that we commissioned from um, an artist called Mark Titchener. It's a re-commission um, of a piece of his called Know Them Only Us and we had it, we, he made it for us in four languages um for the group um and in terms of legacy we're we're um it's part of our forward plan to make 50 percent of our whole program co-authored within the next three years 
so you know we're not gonna it's it's always been part of what we do it's never gonna it's never gonna fall by the wayside for sure um so thank you for listening sorry if i'm over <laughs> my time thank you thank you so much emma um uh, that was absolutely fascinating well we're straight on to uh sarah and trish from turner contemporary Um, oh, can you see the slides? We can. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, I think Sarah and I are going to do a double act. So I'm going to be doing um, a brief presentation um, about uh, an exhibition that happened at Turner Contemporary in 2018. And Sarah will be on the panel um, afterwards. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a particular exhibition that I worked on as research curator at Turner Contemporary. Um, it was an exhibition uh, that was co-curated with local people uh, and also involved Professor Mike Tooby, who instigated um, the show and worked as guest curator also in collaboration. Um, so the starting point for this exhibition, Journeys with the Wasteland, was actually a nugget of local history. So um, it started with T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, which I don't know if you're familiar, it's a seminal, quite difficult, uh, well, renownedly difficult modernist poem, poem um, which was published in 1922, but he wrote a key part of it uh, in Margate in 1921 when he was um, experiencing some mental health issues and sort of signed off work. Uh, and he wrote 50 lines um, in this shelter. And you can see Turner Contemporary uh, in the distance there now, obviously wasn't there then. Um, so the starting point for this exhibition was the poem itself, um, a poem which kind of has this local reference. Um, but I think something's, there's something really interesting in co-production in terms of, you know, how does the content um, uh, or the idea to kind of decide to open things up, how does that match the sort of the content of what you're looking at? And there's a really beautiful kind of analogy uh, with the wasteland in that it's a very sort of multi-voiced multi piece. There's no linear narrative. It shifts between uh, different times. One moment you're in ancient Greece, the next you're in a pub. Um, so in a way it kind of invites uh, multiplicity, it invites multiple voices uh, to interpret it. So the premise was to take this as a starting point and nearly a hundred years after it had been written, open it up for interpretation and see what people living locally uh, would make of it in terms of um, interpreting the poem and drawing connections between this text and visual, the visual arts. Um, so the starting point is always, I suppose, with co-production, it's, you know, who are you going, that question of who are you going to work with and how and what, what comes first. Um, and we looked at various different strategies. Um, so I was, my role was very much to develop the methodology and, um, yeah, work out sort of how to open up the backstage of curating to people who had uh, all sorts of different life experiences in the end, um, but none were professional curators. Um, so we looked at various different options ranging from, you know, partnering with different existing groups. Um, but quite quickly, it felt that it was apparent that people were interested on an individual basis, not because they uh, were had membership of a particular group, uh, which might have sort of been a thematic link. Um, so we did an open call. And I was hoping that we'd get maybe 15 people joining a research group. We were inviting people to join us on a journey over three years. Um, and I'd hoped, yeah, we could assemble a group of 15 because it felt quite niche, I thought, you know, curating, T.S. Eliot, um, literature, art. Um, but we had over 100 people get in touch. And this was the first time we met, um, which was actually uh, in the shelter where Eliot had written a bit of the poem on Margate Sands. And we had 67 people uh, show up. And at that point, it was almost like, how, how is this going to be manageable if we're, you know, co-curating with this number? Um, the group did naturally kind of settle, so by the end we had a core group of about 25 people working. Um, so the first phase of the ex developing the exhibition was really about familiarising the group uh, with each other, so everyone kind of feeling comfortable with each other and the premise of an exhibition, um, but also the poem. Um, and what we didn't want to do was um, sort of say, this is really open, if anyone can kind of join and then take people into the, the sort of white cube of the gallery and, and sit down and study a poem line by line as if you're back at school. It was really important to not do that. 
and to think about environments that different people would be comfortable with. Um, so the first stage we worked actually largely off site, so in different venues around Margate, uh, which all precipitated different modes of interaction. So we looked at different sections of the poem, working with different facilitators who opened up poem, the poem in very different ways. So everything ranging from, this was an artist, uh, Rosalie Schweiker, who wasn't very familiar with the poem herself. Um, and we were studying a section of the poem that's actually set in a pub, in a pub, and um, sort of playing with connections and anecdotes and actually, you know, some um, moderated kind of drinking games um, and sort of finding kind of ways of sharing and building knowledge based on that environment. Um, it wasn't about uh, rejecting sort of traditional expertise, but bringing that into dialogue. So we did work closely throughout the process at moments with Professor David Hurd, who was an expert in English literature, um, who kind of provided, uh, I suppose, maybe a more traditional route as well in terms of kind of opening up the poem and um, its, its position in Margate. Um, we also looked at the difference between, I suppose, studying something and actually uh, learning through performance or embodying the poem. So it was really important to the group early on that there were lots of different voices um, and readings of the poem. So you've got on the right uh, young people in a library sort of performing, doing their own performance of a section of the poem. Uh, and third along, the group themselves working with a local sound and improvisation group to kind of explore the poem themselves. Um, so really thinking about how place uh, can um, enable different modes of interaction and different forms of knowledge generation. And I think this, this continued to influence um, the research process uh, as, we, as we kind of developed uh, content and ideas and decision-making tactics. Um, so after that initial stage, uh, this was quite a significant moment. This was about uh, maybe five months in. Um, we invited everybody in the group, so this was the group at that time, uh, to bring a suggestion for something that they felt could be in the show. Um, and it, it was really brilliant because at that moment you could kind of, you got a sense that this, there was a show that was going to happen and this were the kind of potentially the bare bones of it. Um, so contributions at this stage ranged from um, artworks uh, that people had found, for example, on the Tate's collection, through to personal images, through to several people um, were really interested in kind of connections through music. So we had suggestions for albums that might link. So a really broad um, selection of material. And at this time as well, we also um, identified themes that the group felt were really important. So this is a kind of mapping exercise where we were generating different themes and then prioritizing them. And we use those as the basis for the next research stage, um, which was to kind of go into those themes and gather and explore and kind of explore sort of, yeah, both those themes themselves, um, but also um, to kind of generate uh, different ideas, different suggestions and expand uh, what could potentially be in the show. Um, and part of this work, as well as uh, kind of coming up with content and thinking about that, as we went, the group were fully involved in um, decision making and thinking about forms of sharing. So we, um, we, you know, sometimes people were presenting, sometimes we invited other people in, but we also recognised and group members recognised that some of them preferred sort of more intimate uh, exchanges. So we also trialled things like a sort of speed dating process for sharing material. Um, we were constantly sort of trying and testing as we went. Um, and as we went, we were kind of get basically generating um, an initial sort of starting list, which ended up with over sort of 300 art artworks um, and objects on. And we were then faced with the question of, well, how do we now prioritize? Um, how do we prioritize what's right for the exhibition? Um, so we spent a long time, many hours uh, with the group discussing, uh, the group were discussing different options. At one point they wanted to use a quiz show format, which very different to normal curatorial processes, um, but realised that that would just be too time consuming for 300 works. Um, so in the end, they arrived at a very complex voting system. So it was looking at different sections of the poem, different themes, different categories. Um, and what I wanted to flag here is the all important, uh, the kind of gold star vote here. So the group didn't want to end up kind of, you know, in a decision by committee scenario where 
all the obvious things were being chosen. They really wanted to pay attention, find a way to pay attention to individual research interests and the kind of ideas that might be coming up sort of on the peripheries, but, but no less important to a project that was about a group of people. Um, so gold star choices automatically kind of went up the, the ranking when it came to prioritizing. So this was the initial selection day where all these initial choices were laid out and people were kind of voting with different different stickers. And we also cross-checked cross -checked that by dis, um, ditching categories altogether and just working uh, from the artworks themselves and sort of using more visual techniques as well. Um, but we ended up with a solid list that the group were happy with um, and then started to approach lenders. And at that phase, you know, it's, it's quite heavy on, I suppose, the admin side and the group, you know, they weren't there sort of doing all the labor for the show. They were there to, they were, they were following, I suppose, their own interests. So there was one person who was really interested in the administrative side and got involved. Um, but for the group, it was more about their rationale, um, kind of submitting their own cases for why we wanted to loan these works because Turner Contemporary doesn't have its own collection. So all works um, are borrowed in. Um, and then individual members, uh, group members, depending on what they were interested in, would follow up on the research process through visits, um, oh, I've lost the cursor, um, through yeah, going to artist studios or um, visiting archives or doing that kind of further in-depth research. So this is an image of John Newling, uh, who uh, the group commissioned to make a new work in response, and that was in his garden. <clears throat> So they were involved, yeah, in the research process in kind of seeing through that, that those ideas right from the start. Um, but it wasn't just about choosing artworks. It was about the whole design process itself, everything that goes into exhibition making. And interestingly, some of them were really interested in kind of connections between curating and retail and kind of got involved in that side of things as well. Um, but in terms of the design, they designed the show. Um, they had lots of ideas and reached a point where they felt frustrated um, that they couldn't sort of necessarily give those the visual or spatial form that they, they wanted. So at that point, um, they chose an external designer, uh, Nick Mortimer, to work with, who gave them some uh, tactics to help develop that thinking around the sort of the narrative of the show um, and what the visitor experience would be. Um, so working with a model which they made themselves and floor plans and they were then instructing Nick to kind of come up with a design document and he came up with the first one was so kind of complex um, and I think this was really important that they then edited it so it wasn't the institution saying that's not going to work that's going to be too expensive they kind of worked up that document and then went actually we don't need the mezzanine we don't need the false staircase we don't need the radio booth under the stairs it's there's too much going on um, so paired it back um, into something that had, yeah, they were happy with and had more space. Um, thinking about mediation and interpretation and uh, the, the focus of the show was really key. Um, so the whole way through it was a, a debate as to is this about Eliot's poem or is it about us and Eliot's poem? And that was really interesting. Those, those discussions um, kind of permeated the whole project. And the group were not, you know, there were, there were very many different voices within that space. Um, and when it came to interpretation, that was a key moment for these kind of conversations resurfacing. Um, so whether, you know, the, the works would be mediated uh, by quotes from Eliot's poem, whether those might be on the wall or whether it was the sound of the poem that had been so important to them. Um, what happens when five people were really invested in one work? Would they write a collaborative text? Would there be separate labels? Would those be on the wall? Would they be in a booklet? Did it matter that we you know, was it important that the all those different um, interpretations were in there? Um, and I think the group had really different opinions on this. And one of the things which again characterized the process, the co-production process, was when uh, when there were sort of, I suppose, moments of, of thinking, you know, where do we go from here? One uh, really useful strategy was to open up the process. So at this point, um, they did two mock hangs uh, of, of works in the exhibition. They were exactly the same, but they had very different types of interpretation. And they invited a group, a group in, um, people in who were unfamiliar with the process and got their feedback. Um, which was again a sort of really useful tool because they were I suppose started out not knowing much about the curatorial process and by 
sort of two years in had become quite professionalized to a degree. So it was about recognizing uh, new visitors and what their experience might be. This is the show itself. Um, so there were works, uh, you know, sort of works like there's a Hopper work juxtaposed with a work by the Wilson twins. Um, and the Turn of Contemporary has four main galleries. Um, so the first uh, was, um, although they, the group worked with themes, they then thought that was a bit simplistic and kind of rejected them, but then kind of came back to a point where they thought, no, that's, it's, use, it's a useful starting point for audiences. So the initial gallery um, did set a little bit of the context and drew on some of those early themes to do with the post-World War I context, ideas of mythology and journeying, which they had researched. Um, the second space I found really interesting um, because it was, um, they chose to put the, there were three large scale audiovisual works in the group chose not to sort of separate them out across the galleries, but to have them in this very condensed way in the second main space. They were interested in the sound bleed in creating a slightly kind of claustrophobic atmosphere that mirrored their own sensibility and experience of the poem. Um, and so there were these elements, it, it's kind of interesting like the colour scheme as well, it's almost like quite a, I don't know, sort of national gallery red potentially next to these audio visual works. So these really interesting juxtapositions coming through. Um, and just in terms of interpretation, um, in the end, this was really interesting. And the, the third gallery, the Irene Willits Gallery, was all about um, the language of the poem and the poem as a text. And they chose in the end, a few devices for kind of sharing the poem. And one was um, a, a reproduction of Eliot's original manuscript, which shows all these workings out, that it was a process. And I think that was really important for them to show the process. So the poem was displayed through annotated copies where you could see that people were working with it, trying to understand it. It wasn't a kind of fait accompli. Um, and similarly, they chose with interpretation to have um, throughout the gallery, there were audio points where there were recordings of themselves debating the status of the artworks on the walls. So nothing was given. It was very much about them as a group uh, working together at a particular moment in time to create this show. This is the final space, which was um, intended as a contemplative space. Um, lots of direct lip references to the poem and some new commissions. Um, and just very quickly to say a little bit about decision making. Um, I've mentioned a few of the tactics like devising voting systems, uh, testing out, um, but it was really important working with the group that it that we didn't def default, I suppose, to the person who was speaking the loudest. Um, so one of the we developed uh, collectively um, a, an established methodology at Turner Contemporary, which is philosophical inquiry, philosophical inquiry. It's a way of having conversations, which isn't about what you um, know already, but you know about what you construct together in the room. And we developed a way of spatializing that and using it to inform decisions. So it might be that you have a line and you're asking people, you know, do, do we do you agree or disagree with this premise? Maybe we're exploring an aim for the exhibition. Um, people could separate out spatially and you can then sort of explore how people see um, through movement and space as much as through um, speech and voice. Um, this was yet another moment of testing, kind of opening up the show uh, to about 80 people when there was the first iteration of works that had been agreed by lenders and using that to inform the next stage. Um, and just a quick word on, there was a point where I had imagined that over such a long-term project, it might be that people would break into um, smaller groups that may, maybe would mirror departmental structures. Um, so, you know, some people working on design or different people working on interpretation, but everyone wanted to do everything, uh, but also other things in a very differentiated way. So it was a very organic model. Um, and over time, uh, sort of subgroups and areas of specialism and further linkages evolved through the networks and relationships of group members themselves. So we had everything from a walking group who continued to investigate the sort of the, the place-based nature of Elliot in Margate and, and how that could resonate throughout the town, through to a reading group who kept on studying the poem in great depth, through to, um, yeah, the, an occupational therapist in the group picking up on um, Eliot's mental state when he wrote the poem and really wanting to do something specific which we applied for further funding for. Um, 
And I think the agency and the kind of the interest of the group was reflected by the very extensive offsite program that we have. So that was us sort of brainstorming it and it involved um, about 40 different events across town with about yeah, 16 different venues. Um, so there was one example, the, the uh, reading group, the walking group, um, and just a note on evaluation, I think um, you were saying, Sarah, at the start about who we all are in this session. And um, it's really interesting when you think about the project and the narrative and who gets to own that, that, that narrative. Um, and here I am as, you know, the research curator, the person who was within the institution sharing that story today. Um, but when we were thinking about evaluation and the story that would get told um, as a document, the group were really keen that they were constructing that, the shape of that narrative, and it wasn't about an external evaluator kind of coming and interviewing everyone and writing a report. Um, so they wanted to have uh, same status in terms of their, you know, their narratives and also a right to reply. Um, so you might be interested to look at, there's a resource which is online, um, which maps out the process uh, from the perspective of research group members. It's got uh, raw recordings of their voices um, and you can follow either the group themselves or the facilitating curators. So that's myself and Mike Tooby. Um, or you've also got the evaluators uh, sort of um, analysis, but it's not given any more weight in a way than the um, other, other kind of players uh, in the exhibition uh, matrix. Um, so yeah, something something to look at. I suppose it's at all stages. It's how can you create? How at all stages of the project uh, can you kind of create that level playing field and ensure that you've got a range of voices feeding in? Um, I will stop there. Thank you, Trish. Thank you so much. That was also equally fascinating. I know we're running over slightly, but it's just too interesting. So we'll make up time in another place. Right, straight over to Martin O'Neill from the Stove Network. Hello there. I'll, I'll, I will try to be brief um, as much as it's possible. It's all right. No, you can have as much time, equality. I will. <laughs> um, can you see that? Okay. Is that all right? Yes, that looks good. Perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Martin O'Neill. I'm the Artistic Director of the Stove Network. Uh, we're an arts and community organisation based in Dumfries in the southwest of Scotland within Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and there's our kind of like Twitter, Instagram stuff, because basically with this presentation, I'm going to kind of give you a sort of general overview. So we're slightly left field when it comes to perhaps the context of this uh, particular kind of presentation and that it was sort of looking at exhibitions. We're, we're sort of a project that contains mul a multitude of different projects. We are an organization, but we tend to think of ourselves more as a sort of um, project and an experiment in sort of co-production and co-creation and community arts uh, and socially engaged practice more generally. So I'll just start off with a quick quote here, which if I can move the text, this box here. Yep. So this is from a, a writer called Peter Block, uh, who I highly recommend if you're at all interested in community development or process driven by community. And it's uh, ownership is a decision to acknowledge our guilt. In this way, we become the author of our own experience as it is a choice to decide on our own what value and meaning will occur when we show up. It is a stance that each of us is creating in the world, even the one that we have inherited. And um, I thought it was great, Sarah, earlier when you kind of asked for keywords, uh, ownership actually came up, which surprised me quite a bit, actually, um, that it seems to be a sort of uh, developing kind of theme or narrative across the arts in general. So just a bit about the stove. Uh, we are an arts and community organization established in 2011. So we are 10 years old this year. Uh, we still don't have any idea what we're doing about that 10 years, but uh, bear with us over the next year. We might have something to show for it. Um, uh, initially, it was started by a group of artists um, who were kind of slightly perturbed by the sort of rapid degeneration of our high street in Dumfries. And we thought that um, we could do something about it, basically. So we are a building as well, uh, based at 100 High Street Dumfries, uh, where we operate a cafe. Uh, on the ground floor and we have a sort of workshop space which I'm currently sitting in right now and some studios and offices and a workshop upstairs as well as a kitchen. 
Uh, we are the development trust for Dumfries High Street, uh, which is fairly unusual in the fact that we are uh, artist or arts led, uh, we prefer to say. Uh, and I believe we might be the only one in the country as far as kind of development trust. I'm not sure whether that's Scotland and, or Britain. Um, somebody may correct me if I say one or the other, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, our key, key priorities in terms of regeneration is to grow activity, grow people, and grow collaborative partnerships around projects. So it's relatively straightforward, and we like to keep that, that way to try and keep it simple so that if somebody does ask us, we don't have some sort of, oh, please refer to our, our mission statement or something. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, that's us there. Uh, this picture was taken quite a while back. If you were to come here today, it's amazing. Uh, the sun's shining and we have kind of canopy and tables and people outside and the cafe's pretty busy so it's great, uh, very happy, uh, can't get quite over it after a year of lockdown to finally see people uh, in the space. So, uh, And the signboard there, we, uh, we, we tend to think of as a sort of uh, an artwork for the high street. We change this roughly about every six months to reflect um, the sort of feeling uh, within the town or sort of through a project that we might have come up with that's either a quote from somebody or it's something that we kind of have curated out of uh, some conversations. Uh, so that one in particular came from uh, a kid who had written on a postcard of her project that we did uh, to reflect on Dumfries and he, all he said was sometimes it's sunny. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so Dumfries, a little bit about it. Uh, we are the largest town in Dumfries and Galloway in the southwest of Scotland. Uh, one of the major kind of things there is our proximity to both Carlisle uh, um, and our proximity to Glasgow and of course Edinburgh as well. So we're not exactly, we are a population centre of about 30,000 people. Uh, so it is the largest kind of population within the uh, region. But we do obviously inevitably lose a lot of kind of our, our young people and, you know, where they might want to go, it tends to go towards Carlisle or you know, towards England to the south or up to Glasgow, where the main kind of uh, cultural centres um, uh, are. Um, so this is our high street. Um, and one thing to say about the high street is in the top 10% top of the multiple index of deprivation uh, or the index of multiple deprivation, one or the other. Um, so we are working within a quite, a, you know, a difficult kind of area in terms of the, the sort of socioeconomic kind of landscape that we're uh, working within and the community landscape therein as well. Um, it's like most high streets now, if you go to sort of in between towns across the country, they are, um, you see the sort of rapid demise of rampant capitalism uh, played out within these contexts. So. Uh, it's very apparent here, um, especially now after the lockdown, we've uh, lost several quite major retail employers on the high street and things are just looking pretty grim. Uh, so the sort of central purpose of us is what is the purpose of a rural market town in the 21st century? So that looks at the sort of general identity and theme of our town and what our community really does and how, how are we kind of represented within the physicality and within the kind of activity that happens on the high street. So what we do, um, so we have a kind of, um, I guess it's, we're in a transitional phase right now, so it's hard to kind of describe all this because um, my narrative is different from the narrative I should be saying to you. But um, we run projects across what we call kind of three different areas, which is learn and connect. So that's like connecting people through skill sharing, through creative opportunities, commissions, jobs, etc. Uh, change and inspire. So that's generally kind of the work we do around the high street or policy making initiatives that using culture to kind of exemplify or make a point uh, towards the Scottish government. And recently they have really paid attention, which is great. Um, and create and collaborate, which is really the sort of spaces where we create, uh, where co-creation spaces happen and co-production. And that goes through a whole gamut of multidisciplinary approaches from literature, poetry, performance, theatre, writing to uh, actual public art and uh, community arts as well. So we do run a programme of activity um, or have done, we're sort of in a testing trialling period just now in terms of the live activity that we're able to do. Um, so that we're before the lockdown, somehow we were averaging about four to six events per week. Um, which obviously was was quite insane. <laughs> if you kind of look back at a calendar now and you're a bit kind of taken aback. Um, and that utilised the cafe space as well as some of the high street spaces as well and takeover models, et cetera, and working across different partners. 
Um, we are a kind of sort of engine room for the creative industries down here. Um, we sort of, you know, provide a lot of commissions and opportunities. And that is through the sort of scale from established to emerging to community to, you know, it's really about, uh, someone mentioned pathways earlier, and that's very much kind of how we like to think of our project is growing, not just their kind of participation within that specific thing, but also with their potential and in sort of integrating on a larger uh, kind of cultural uh, industry. Uh, we are a hub for the creative in of industries, meaning that we're sort of a center base, we're a building so people can use us. Uh, we do give out space for free to community groups as well, and people are welcome to use our cafe for that, those purposes. And generally, we like to think of ourselves as a sort of incub incubation space to test, experiment and grow new projects. So basically, we like to think of we start the plate spinning with different people and then whoever might have initiated that with us, they then kind of move that on and create maybe a new com community interest company or a new organization or a new project or initiative in Dumfries. So this is just a sort of, you know, slightly poor picture of all the sorts of activity that we do. Uh, at the top left there, it's a conversing building. So that's our general kind of, if you're looking at exhibition purposes, we actually kind of, uh, we call what we call conversing building as a space that we use within the cafe that's utilizing the actual cafe space is almost a sort of exhibition space, but it's also utilizing, you know, the cafe staff, what they're wearing on their t-shirts, what the conversation might be and what's on the walls. And it's very much participative and we invite kind of conversation through that. Uh, that and there is actually a booth where we kind of set up so you could either speak with a certain person, either like an artist or public artist or producer to kind of just, just ask questions, see what they're actually all about. Um, down at the far bottom left there, that's Brave New Words. That's one of our most long-standing projects, a sort of regular program. And that's a sort of basically an open mic that we do every single month. Uh, we continued it throughout the lockdown. Uh, to varying degrees of sort of te technical um, ability and proficient, <laughs> but uh, it was, um, so yeah, that's been going for quite a long time now and our average audience and participants, our audience is about 50 per month, participants is sort of increasing from about 20 up to 30, which is difficult to manage within a small cafe space we're imagining. Uh, and this to the right there, that sign and dine where we uh, created sort of deaf cafe um, that would be taken over each kind of day. And that was a very much a blended space for the hearing community and the deaf community to collaborate and learn. So co-production, so very much at the heart of everything we do is a practice that is rooted in, our se in a sense of place. Uh, and that means a sort of whole plethora of things in terms of the direction and the prioritization of how we kind of approach things. So generally we like to think like, how is this project unique to this particular space than this time and where we are right now? And could this ha project happen anywhere but Dumfries? Um, and generally we try to make work that is resonant and participative and collaborative with, the pe with our community at the heart of it. How we kind of start this is a sort of various different ways. We like to see we're very much kind of re responsive. So we throw things at the wall, we don't over strategize. Um, we're trying to kind of, we just do. So we create spaces for people to kind of come in and we're not predetermining the outcome. We're not predetermining what the project might be. We're not predetermining what people's perception of that might be. We create spaces, have a topic of conversation. It could be something as an, an, as an open mic that we explore a theme. It could be a sort of, creative consultation around the high street or a particular own usage of a building. Um, so it's very much about collaboration with individuals, groups and initiatives and other organizations across the region. Uh, as I touched on earlier, we use the cafe space to sort of encourage that continuing conversation as well. So in the left there, that was looking at sort of public transport across the region, which is historically pretty bad. And to the right there, that was, a, I think that was a consultation around um, uh, our a really historic landmark in Rosefield Mills where we used kind of creativity and artists at each table to sort of interrogate that. This was an early project in terms of the sort of narrative of the stove uh, where we kind of created a town charter for people to, to kind of collaborate and work with and write their own and then we displayed these and this was also a social media campaign at the very early days to sort of get people in conversation where you could pick up one of these things and one of those speech bubbles and go around the town and sort of interact with us that way as well. Um, 
So what we're kind of most kind of known for in the context of sort of socially engaged arts practices is indeed the kind of urban community ownership. Uh, so we started this in 20, 2015, 2016, um, looking at the, our high street and what we call just over, if I'm looking out the window right now, it's a set of kind of buildings that we now term the mid steeple quarter. Uh, we back, began this conversation sort of internally and then invited our community through what we called chapter one. So it was the very first start of this conversation. And then we took over an empty unit within that space and created a cinema space to show a film about entitled A House in the High Street, which is a documentary exploring the history and the potential future of our high street. And we had sort of, uh, a, again, another charter in there. People could sign up to learn more and people could actually kind of sign up to be part of like the community that would change this place. Um, I'll move swiftly on. That's the sort of, so to the sort of red there, that's sort of the stove. Oh, sorry, apologies. Where the arrow is pointing, that's the stove. And that red area just there is the mid steeple quarter. Um, that since uh, moving fast forward to today, that since is not now no longer a sort of stove project. We very much work in collaboration with them, but it has become its own organisation, its own board, its own constituted thing. Who are doing incredible things? They've literally just purchased I don't know how many buildings there, but it's happening, and it's an amazing thing to see that how creativity and the community working together through those means can actually, we, we started this plate spinning and now it's now it's in other hands and it's amazing what's happening. Similar to that, um, in terms of the new projects that emerge and new organizations, it was Dumfries Music Conference, which is a regular uh, music conference that happens every October where it takes over different spaces within the town. And it's very much kind of getting young people invested within music and the music industry as well. As uh, Similar to that is the Deluxe Light Festival, which began as a sort of partnership project, but now it's very much its own sort of organization and project. And it's primarily focused around games, uh, interactivity, public art projection, and um, mental health. So just to speak kind of broadly about co-creation and how we mean it within our place, um, we kind of think of ourselves as a, this sort of creative enterprise, you know, development part of what we're all about. Um, so it's not just we live in this sort of space of sort of socially engaged practice. We actually have an ownership and accountability to doing various different things around enterprise. And we work with our community uh, in order to do that as well. And as well as working with various different partnerships and organizations and our local authority, the Scottish government. And right in the middle there, we, what we term between those kind of hybrid worlds is creative placemaking. Um, and recently we did, uh, my colleague Catherine um, drafted this sort of proposal for creative placemaking place for the south of Scotland, which you can download via uh, the website. Whilst it is specific to south of Scotland, uh, it is quite interesting in terms of the the developing narrative of what's happening across the country. And this is just a sort of uh, microcosm of what's happening and the role of creativity within creating places. Now, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, the Culture Collective project, this is our next incarnation uh, where we're moving slightly, we're expanding our sort of role out with Dumfries and moving further into the region. And the Culture Collective has been placed as, as I think I believe it's six million investment from the Scottish government and administered uh, through Creative Scotland where each kind of different locality or organizations across Scotland has kind of proposed a way of working with communities in a way that is sort of investigating and exploring uh, COVID recovery, but in a much more kind of integrated way. Um, um, our, our particular project for this is what we do now. And it comes from a quote from Marcus Aurelius, which is what we do now echoes in, in eternity. And this is very much an evolution, both of our practice and the Embers report, where we're actually getting to trial and, and move this forward. So we are working with up to five different towns and the whole spread of the region. And we're employing two artists, two artists or artist collectives uh, within um, each of these places and they're working specifically with what we call a place hub so that's either a sort of community group that has a sort of building or it's a development trust or it's a similar kind of arts organization within those different places these are langham northwest and Fries. they're specifically working on a very specific street in northwest which is fantastic uh, castle douglas Stranraer, and sanker so 
it's a very very integrated project um, and yeah that will that's uh, we've just kind of got the 12 artists now and very much looking forward to it and uh, thank you very much that's me <laughs> thank you martin thank you so much that's absolutely fascinating and, and i'd encourage all of the presenters please put the links up into the chat as well that you had in your presentations please please share those um and and yeah there's there's real themes there of connecting the dots you know that, that through through all of those um themes around place and fun i think we'll finish on fun right so we're going to take a quick five minute break we will start back at at uh 3 25 exactly so um go stretch your legs dance around your kitchen whatever and i'll see you back in five <laughs> good stuff hello everyone welcome back okay so we're going to um, could tail the, the panel discussion a little bit because I think it, it's really important to give you some time to go into breakout rooms to do a bit of action planning of your own. We can't do something about co-production and, and not let everybody have a chat about it. That would that would feel wrong. So um, yeah, uh, we've just got an opportunity now for a bit of a Q and A with our fabulous presenters. Um, so if you have. And there is, there is one question there about, about why you're called the stove network, which maybe goes slightly off. So maybe you could answer that one, Martin, in the chat in a bit. But um, I would like to throw a question to any of you, actually. Um, and, and just to explain, Trish, you did the presentation, has now morphed into Sarah here. Um, who, who, what's your role, your title, Sarah Contempor uh, Turner Contemporary? Um, I'm head of exhibitions at Turner Contemporary, so I, um, I, well, I sort of line managed Trish in that role, so I was working on the project over the three years. Great, thank you very much. So yes, the question I've got is, um, as you've developed your co-production processes, what's the best thing that you've learnt with hindsight to do the next time round? Happy to kick off. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot I would say that we've learned with hindsight. I think probably for me, the biggest thing is just like the value of this way of working, actually. Um, I mean, the Journeys with the Wasteland that Trish spoke about was probably the biggest, co well, it was the biggest co-production project we had worked on since the gallery opened. There'd been smaller scale things in the years leading up to that. But um, I mean, there was just huge value in, in working in that way for us as an organisation and for the participants and for the audiences and um, all the usual sort of measures of success that one might apply to an exhibition, such as visitor numbers, um, critical responses, etc., were all, you know, incredibly positive and probably outstripped our expectations. Um, so I think that's that's the key thing for me. But also, I think it came up earlier, but the time and resource required to work in this way. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear Emma say that at uh, first sight they're working, working towards 50% co-production, which is, you know, really um, impressive. But I think, you know, we couldn't have delivered this project in less than three years, I don't think, and without considerable additional fundraising to do it with the kind of depth that I hope came across in Trisha's presentation really did require that, that, that amount of time. Thank you. Emma, Martin, what about you? What about your useful hindsight tips? Um, I think for me, it's um, perhaps that you really have to be quite um, thoughtful about how to communicate um, with different groups because and find out what works for them. Because I definitely found that it, the hardest thing about all of these projects was getting hold of the people and getting them all. Um, and making sure that everybody felt like they were involved, even if they couldn't come to the meetings or um, things like that. So it, we ended up with so many different ways of communication. So I had like a WhatsApp group, I had email, I had Zoom, I had like, you know, normal emails, um, kind of like video tours of things that I'd done with different people. Um, you just had to be really like, really communicative with those, with the people you're working with and just ask them what works for them and just be really prepared to kind of change the way that you work because not everybody responds to email very well at all. Um, oh, and just phoning people. Like I'm really anxious about phoning people, but some people only really want to talk on the phone. 
So you kind of had to, yeah, kind of had to uh, go with it, really. Your flexibility shows in that, you know, someone seems to be sort of dropping ball bearings into a tray behind you consistently through your presentation and you've kept your focus. Oh, really? Brilliantly. <laughs> I've got no idea. Interesting noises, but it just shows that you're just, you're just working with it. It's great. Yeah. Now we're in exhibition install at the moment, so it's quite hectic. <laughs> so anything could be happening behind me and I'm just like, come in. <laughs> Rona is asking, do any of you have a set of principles or ways of working that you have developed that you can share? Have you got the magic wand tool book, toolkit for everyone? Uh, I, yeah, I think... Oh, sorry. You go, you go. <laughs> Um, I, I guess there, there, there's a there's a principle in terms of uh, equity and equality, um, and I separate those in the very literal sense that in order to be equal, you almost need to be equitable as well. Um, particularly within working in our context, it's not everyone can speak the same language, not everyone has the same amount of confidence in terms of how they might kind of step to the step into the room. Um, there's a lot to say for hospitality. Um, inviting, locking eyes, shaking hands, obviously COVID permitting, <laughs> uh, and sort of an invitation within that. Uh, throughout the lockdown, uh, we ran a project called Homegrown. It was um, where rather than kind of thematically base our kind of programming for that, we went by values and we were accountable to those values and what we were kind of doing. So we had a sort of reflective evaluation throughout it, which was uh, and the values were open heartedness, solidarity, insight and perseverance, um, which we literally put on the signboard uh, as well to, and on our windows to sort of say we are accountable to these. So be in conversation with us. Great, thank you. Emma, what were you going to say? Um, I was going to say um, not not really, um, to the, is the answer to the question, just because with every group that, in my experience, with every group that I've worked with, it's completely different. Um, it, you know, it doesn't, what, what works with one group won't necessarily work with another group. You, I guess the clue is finding as much, in, finding as much, like getting to know those people as much as possible before you start introducing a project or something and then maybe you'll already know you'll already have an idea about what the best way to what the best way to proceed might be for example um or you could talk to them like what you know you could ask them how you know how do you think this might work or do you feel comfortable about this i think the most important thing is whether they feel it's just helping them to feel comfortable and welcome and then you're going to get a lot more out of them if they already feel comfortable Whereas if they feel like terrified by your building or any of that, then that's, it's going to be much harder. Like, we had a very fortunate benefit of the fact that they already met in the building. So they were already really comfortable in the space. So I just went to where they normally were and it felt like it was theirs anyway. Um, but yeah, there's not really any set in stone kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, there seems to be that, that theme of place in terms of like with um, journeys with the wasteland, like doing stuff in the pub when the bit relates to the bit in the pub, obviously with your high street, Martin, you know, that's right in the, the heart of the community, going to where people are. A marketing expert told me it was about marketing, but I think it totally relates to co-production in that fish where the fish are. And that meant about how you, you know, gain clients and things in a slightly cynical capitalist way, but translating that into how you want to, you know, create participatory processes. Can I also quickly add something which we did um, make a slight mistake on once is that we organised a really major meeting for a time which happened to coincide with a really important Muslim religious holiday. So nobody came, obviously. <laughs> so... Um, it really is kind of like just knowing knowing your crowd, I suppose, and trying not to make silly mistakes like that. Um, but we got a lot of feedback about that, obviously. Everyone was like, well, that's very silly, isn't it? And we were like, yeah, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> and then I got a calendar given to me and then it was all fine. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, and, and also I, I was really struck with that sense of, of 
what culture is to lots of different people means different things. You know, like culture being something that you eat, wear and share, or culture is something that happens in different buildings or different spaces or different environments. Any other questions from anybody? You can you can just unmute yourself and shout, I think. There's, there's not. Oh, here's one from Anna. How do you work with funders who might be more used to seeing a carefully defined and detailed project scope? Yes. So if you want to work and let, let a group decide what something is, how do you get that funded? Who's going to go for that one? Martin is. Yeah, I, I, we're, 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 I don't know if we're, if we're entirely unusual, but we, we are, we are in a, a Creative Scotland RFO, which I think in, in England, sorry, what is it? Uh, in, in NPO, field. yeah. Um, so similar sort of, you know, three year funded, regularly funded organisation. Um, that covers us for a core element, but actually a lot of our funding comes through uh, various different in pockets, whether because we are a development trust, so we have access to certain funding through, you know, the community route or the enterprise route. Um, certainly working with partners as well in terms of that stuff. Um, it really, I, I can't, I can't say like how exactly that goes. Um, it's really case by case um, and how, what they kind of require. Generally, we, we kind of are able, we, we think of kind of, you know, whilst there are, you know, what you're going to do the money do with the money and sort of designate the stages etc we can be fairly kind of exploratory in our language and be specific but also slightly unspecific as well um, i think we've got a bit of a knack for that and um, it's also kind of lucky enough that after 10 years that we can demonstrate practice a lot more than many others um, so early on you know it's it's about growth really it's, it's being able to tap into the funding and and where you can have to do that and then they expand as you sort of get your reputation. So not sure how helpful that was, but um, it's a diverse, it's a ball game every single time. But, but there is something in that, isn't there, of, of um, beyond the projectism, I'm going to use that loads now, uh, but thinking about how project to project connects as well within your, your work and your practice. And so, yeah, you're building up a a portfolio of examples and testimonials. Right, now we are going to head into, thank you so much. I, I should have said that first rather than launching in. Thank you, Emma, thank you, Martin, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're now gonna head into um, breakout rooms for a little bit of time for about, not a huge amount of time. I think we're looking at about 14 minutes, Tom. Is that quite specific? But I think that, that will absolutely nail it. So, um, uh, in those rooms, what I'd like you to do is look at, um, you can have a conversation about what's come up, what's coming up for you, but really by the end of it, I'd like you to have one action related to co-production. I appreciate you all in a really different situation. You've all got quite different um, places that you work and different roles, but one action in terms of co-production that you could put in place tomorrow, it might be something tiny, it could be something huge, and maybe if, if, you, if there is a bit of, of planning and action you could put into place sort of in the slightly longer term. But one action tomorrow, just something is, is your main task there, please. Um, so we'll pop you into breakout rooms to have a chat with that. If at any point you're like, I don't know what Sarah's on about, you can ask for help and I'll pop in and, and say hello to you. And then we'll all come back and just wrap it up. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, I know it, it always feels like it goes in a flash, the, the breakout rooms, doesn't it? But um, hopefully that was useful. Would anybody like to share an action, big or small? You can just unmute. Yeah, Annabelle. Um, so, yes, it's quite challenging what I'm going to actually do tomorrow. Um, I'll just explain to my group my previous experiences with um, co-production in terms of an artist co-producing with an audience rather than a curatorial co-production model. Um, so I've been very inspired with everything I've heard. So it's about thinking how I'm, I work at the University of Hertfordshire, how I can work with some non-art students to curate with our collection or work with our collection. So probably an action tomorrow 
could be getting in touch um, with someone at the student union to maybe source a group of non-arts society or a group of students. I, you know, I need to make, yeah, f find those students tomorrow, uh, uh, access to them. Yeah. Fabulous, thanks Annabelle, thanks for sharing. Who else would like to share? Go on. It's not too scary. Well, I can say something Thank for you. our group, yeah. Um, so we talked about um, the importance of not having preconceptions about what your out outputs of the project were going to be. I think we all have various things that we want to do, but not necessarily kind of trying to find those early on. Nice. Where do you work, Matthew? So I'm at the University of Dundee Museums. Ah, yeah. You've got some art behind you. <laughs> Good stuff. Anything else that came up? It was less of an action for us, but we, I mean, we were just um, having a discussion about um, some of the challenges around um, project, having project staff and expertise in place and then losing that at the end. And I mean, I was just talking about the challenge of my projects and one of those projects, we've got time, we're time limited and I've got a small team that are all contracts come to an end and the project comes to an end. Um, but my aim is to develop a strategy, a long-term strategy with an action plan. So it's about trying to embed what I'm doing across staff who aren't necessarily as supportive or not as supportive, but are not directly in the project as well. So it was just about kind of trying to have the best dialogue possible across different staff teams about what you're doing. Absolutely. And if, um, if you had all the budget in the world, what, what would you do tomorrow? I'd employ permanent staff doing the jobs that we're doing right now. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it's, it's so, it's, it, it feels so dull, doesn't it? Because it's the same question, capacity resource, and it goes around from department to department. But I mean, especially when you're doing community work, is one of the most fundamental things is trust building and long-term um, relationships with people as well. So if you're trying to, develop an audience to be part of your space, your organization. Um, familiar, familiar faces make a big impact um, and, and, and continuity as well. Um, and continuity when you're um, having, creating those good networks and, and partnerships. Um, but you know, I, I, that's also, it's also not always practical as well. It's just one of those challenges of management. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. I mean, yeah, it's an age-old thing because it's something that always needs addressing, doesn't it? Any other thoughts anybody would like to share? Jill? Yeah, so um, my, I work exhibitions at a museum in Carlisle called Tully House, and I was saying that in my group that I tend to get the end product of co-production. So currently our community teams and um, more recently our cur curatorial teams have got, re have got really, really good. We're part of the Odd Bought Buy For All um, initiative and they've been doing some really great work on co-production. But I just see it at the end. So my, um, my goal, short-term goal is to, to try and get involved earlier on and um, maybe even come up with a project of my very own um, to work on with people and, and not just let it be something that the community guys and the, the curators have to deal with themselves, make it more part of um, my job too. Nice, yeah, brilliant. Thank you for sharing. Okay, I've got, we've just got our last couple of minutes. I've got a little link that I am popping into the chat box just now. And if you click on that link, it will take you to Mentimeter, which will ask you for one word to sum up today, which I know is quite hard and you've probably got several words, um, but if you can just, you know, follow just your instinct and go for the word that jumps into your head and pop it in there, that would be great. And if everybody does that, I'm gonna test this. I haven't used this before, so I'm hoping it, it works. I'm gonna put a word in too, because I want to join in. Um, I'm hoping it works in terms of getting the results before we finish. 
Okay, so if you haven't put your word in, you've got 10 seconds left to quickly click on the link and put your word in. And I'm going to be fair and actually give you those 10 seconds. I used to run a lot of drama workshops and I used to make up time. I'm like, you've got 30 seconds to do this. You've got five minutes. And I, I never had a watch on. And I never got rumbled. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, right. I will see if, if we have managed to... Oh, yes, there are words. Right. Okay. Um, how do I do that? Oh, no. I need to share my screen first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, share screen. There we go. Those are our words today. I like it. Fun, unknowing, opening, gathering, trust, ownership. Exciting. They had one each. And then informative and thought provoking, I think, had two. And insightful had more than that. And inspiring had several. Thank you. That's lovely. Lovely words. No one decided to be a rebel and write something terrible. Uh, I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, no one's gone full rogue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for hanging around. You get the, the pre presenter's sort of gold star for <laughs> still being here. Um, if you can complete the survey, yeah, if you can click on that link, um, and Anna will be forever grateful that you can give her some information, just how, you know, how it's worked in terms of just jumping online and doing it. Um, yeah, and... Uh, so click on the link and Tom, is there any closing comments you want to make? Just a big thank you really. Um, thanks to everyone for taking the time today to join us. Um, I know everyone's schedules is packed, so thank you for that. Thank you, Sarah, for pulling together such a great session. And I think the word cloud gives a sense of how people have found it. And then thank you to all our panel, Sarah, Emma, Martin and Trish for bringing together so many different and inspiring projects for us today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope we'll see you at future sessions. If you're not on our mailing list, as I said, do get in touch so you can hear about future opportunities. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Hey, last thing to do, unmute yourselves and we'll just sort of give ourselves a round of applause because I quite like making a bit of noise on things, so. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thursday evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Bye.